In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us completely, we thank you, dear Lord, for these times where we're reminded what amazing love you had for us in coming to this earth and walking among us and revealing to us the glory of your Father and his righteousness. I thank you, dear Lord, for the salvation you've offered us. I thank you, dear Lord, for desiring to be like us, that you might understand our pain, our suffering, that you might be uncompassionate Savior for us. I pray, dear Lord, for this church. I pray for this meeting. I pray for your guidance, dear Lord. I pray that you would lead us to accomplish your will, to build your kingdom. I pray, dear Lord, that you would transform each and every one of our lives, that we might be more and more like you, made holy in your image from glory to glory. We pray for the children of this church. We pray for those who are far from this church. We pray for those who have not yet known you. We pray for those, dear Lord, who are in great need, dear Lord, and you have a desire for us to help them. I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts, dear Lord, that we might have eyes like your eyes and that you might have our hearts broken for the things that break yours. I pray through the intercession of St. Mary, St. John, the prophets, and all the apostles, hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. We're going to do part two of this series on generous giving. This is one of our church's core values. We don't want to just give. I know that giving is important and all churches do it. But we want to do something different. We want to be generous givers. We want to do it with cheer, with thoughtfulness, with compassion, with integrity, using God's gifts and resources He's given us. We want to be able to meet the needs of others. We want to be building God's kingdom. The kind of giving that we're talking about is the kind of giving, hopefully, that people eventually will ask you, why are you doing that? Last week we started this series and I wanted to make sure that the point was driven home. Here in America, especially at Christmas time, we think of taking and receiving, oftentimes more than giving. And the reality is that when we think about it, we're takers and receivers oftentimes more than we are givers. We're following the American dream. We're building our own kingdoms sometimes more than we think about God's. We talked about how we are consumers, that we're taught to always want more, to want newer, to want better. We realize that sometimes the mentality of more that is developing in me is because I feel like I deserve it or might be because I've lost self-control over my desires, or maybe because we aren't content with the things that we have, or maybe because we just haven't been satisfied in God Himself enough. We want more stuff. And we spoke about the steps that fall, help us to fall into the trap of wanting more stuff, and we spoke about the ways to combat it. Now, before we go on into our plan of how we're going to give, I wanted to look at some examples of giving over the next few weeks. The goal is not to give as much as they did, but rather the goal is to give with the spirit that they gave. I'll be honest, I have a lot of heroes in my life. To me, they're all super. And they don't all wear spandex costumes all the time. They don't have their own superpowers. The people that inspire me, that make me want to go in a certain direction, to change everything that I do, that make me want to be like them. Those people, when I think about it, are leaps and bounds greater than I am. And I admire them. The heroes that I have are not the ones who made the most points in basketball, because those people, when they're on the Lakers, forget when to stop shooting. It's not the people who have made the most money with some crazy invention or people with the greatest singing voice. 
Although sometimes I think I should have used my gifts and pursued a career in singing. Or it's not the person that makes the best macarona bechamel. Mom, you're more than just a hero to me. The ones that I love the most are the ones who gave the most. The most money, the most creative way, the most time, actually the most of themselves. There's a series of books about missionaries from the last couple of centuries. And to get your name into this series is an incredible accomplishment. And the lives that I've read have really inspired me. And you want to know what the name of the series is? And some gave 10%. Actually, no, it's not. That wouldn't be a very exciting series, right? The series is called, And Some Gave All. I mean, to me, that is inspiring. To people who became selfless, living sacrifices, generous givers, they held nothing back, they didn't become indulgent takers or receivers. I am not there, but I admire those who have gone to the great extent to give all. Now, in the Bible, we have several examples I'm not going to go through all of them, but we have a wasteful father, an accepted prostitute, a kid with a big heart, and some hungry Greek people. And we'll go over some of those examples next week. But today we're just going to look at the father. You guys know the story. Christ was sitting with some tax collectors, some sinners, the most despised people of the Jewish nation. Despised because tax collectors were put on the same level as prostitutes, close to being a leper. And the Pharisees saw him sitting with them and they questioned his integrity. So he gave them an illustration that demonstrated his integrity. His integrity. Now we call that story usually the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son. You know the man with the two sons where the younger kid immature, selfish, greedy, irresponsible, ask for his inheritance before the father dies. Can you imagine calling the insurance company, saying, um, I know my parents haven't died yet, but I was wondering if you could just forward me that stuff because I want it now. As ridiculous as that sounds, that's the person in the story. And we know that his dad is wealthy, very wealthy. I mean, the audacity of this kid. We know the story, right? He gets the money. He actually doesn't stay at home. He actually spends the money on a place far away. And what was he doing? Well, we know that he spent the money on his friends, probably without control, not according to a budget, not planning on saving. What kind of investments did he make while he was there? None. What was the value of the things he purchased? None. He ate and drank with his friends until it was all gone. All gone. I mean, he came to the point where he had nothing to eat. When you start to envy the pig, not because of the bacon potential, but because of what the pig itself is eating, you know you're in a low place. Now, I don't know how long it took for this kid to do this. It doesn't matter to me. This story, if it were told in modern day times, it makes me mad. I begin to think about Generation X. Or are we on Y now? Maybe it's even Z. But I think they're so wasteful, extravagantly wasteful. And actually, that's what prodigal means extravagantly wasteful. And yet, as much as we call the son prodigal and the son wasteful, don't you think the father deserves the title even more? And did he not know he was throwing his money down the drain? That it would be completely lost? It would have been better to just put the money in the ground? It wasn't for a bright future that he gave the money. It wasn't for an education. It was merely so that the money would be lost. And he gave it anyway. Then when the kids come back, when the kid comes back, before the kid even apologizes fully, 
He overlooks everything. He gives him a ring, a new pair of shoes, a robe, and a veal dinner. I mean, the kid gets more things wasted on him. Could we argue that the wasteful person, the extravagantly wasteful person in the story is the father, the prodigal father, extravagantly wasteful on his child? And that's actually what our father is, extravagantly generous with us. When I think about the type of giving that God is character of, characteristic of, it boggles my mind. And apparently the people who knew him personally felt the same way. In the book of James, there's this verse that must have come based on personal experience. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning of his own will. I mean, good and perfect gifts come from, come from God. St. Paul tells us this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Not with some, but with every. In Ephesians chapter 3, he says a few more things. He says this. Bless, um, sorry. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints. Not just his love, but he says, what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think according to that power that works in us. This is not description of a stingy God. This is a God who gives in abundance. I want to talk about a few kinds of giving. I kind of came up with a few and maybe you'll kind of reason with me here. There are some people that are rich and when they give, the rich me remain rich and the poor remain poor. And to be honest, that's the majority of all the giving, right? We see a homeless man and we give him a dollar. Sometimes we donate a coat. Sometimes we donate a toy. Sometimes we buy a lunch. But in the end... Oftentimes, our wealth remains preserved and that person's poverty has not changed. Type 2, which is a slightly better, actually maybe it's even much better. It's when the poor give to the poor. When the poor give to the poor, the giver actually gets poorer. And usually the still, the poor, remain poor. But that is much better, right? Well, there's a third kind of giving that I thought of. It's when the rich give to the poor, but the poor actually become rich. And the rich still remain rich. But this is an awesome kind of giving. It's not like giving a kid a meal or a coat. It's like when someone says, you look at a kid and you say, you know what? You're going to be rich. I'm going to pay for your education. I'm going to get you the best books. I'm going to get you the best clothes. I'm going to get you tutors. I'm going to provide you with a future. To me, that's very inspiring that someone is willing to go all that way to invest so that a poor person doesn't remain poor, but the poor person becomes rich. I think that is something that is very doable for all of us. But believe it or not, there's another kind of giving that I wanted to talk about. It's this one. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. This is different. This is when a rich person decides, I'm going to make that poor person rich 
by me becoming poor. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I mean, this is the incarnation. And it kind of goes along with something that we say in the uh, Kiach praises. He took what belongs to us and He gave us what belongs to Him. I'm calling this God-like giving. And this really has to get you. Well, let's break this verse down. What is rich? It says, He was rich. God was rich. Well, I cannot even begin to explain how God was rich. My brother told me a story recently. He went to go visit one of the people in his congregation. He's an orthopedic surgeon. He's not broke by any means. By most standards, he does pretty well. And then he was telling my brother, he says, you know, my son came home from school one day. He's like, Dad, are we poor? He looks around. He's like, I don't think so. He says, why do you ask? He says, well, my friend at school, his dad makes $250 million a year. Then his dad looks at him and says, well, then I guess we're poor. <laughs> I mean, that is, that's pretty rich. And you know, like that, they must have more than what they know to do with all the stuff they have. I mean, that's really rich. That doesn't even begin to touch the tip of the iceberg of how rich God is. But I thought of a few things that are in the Bible. I mean, God created the heavens and the earth with his word. In the morning, he calls the sun to rise. And at night, he puts the sun to sleep. Here's one that gets me. God feeds worms. He has such concern that even the worms are fed. I mean, he must have so much to give. And another thing I know he cares about, the Bible tells us that God feeds birds. And unfortunately for the worms, the birds never go hungry. God cares for worms and for all the birds. I don't hear that many stories of bird famines. I mean, God is just giving. The Bible says that the mountains melt like wax in his presence, that all the creations praise him, that the cherubim and the seraphim, because of his glory, they cover their face and they cover their feet, that the holy creatures, when they're in his presence and they say, you're way too much even for us. I mean, that is a very poor glimpse of God's riches. Now, with God's riches beyond our wildest imagination, there's some people he could have just given and we would have had an abundance like that kid's dad. That guy could probably just give and still remain pretty wealthy. God could have done that, but he didn't choose to do it that way. Instead, he became poor. Well, how do I describe poor? Um, again, going back to that verse in the Tzbaha, he took what belongs to us and gave us what belongs to him. When you imagine poor, what do you think of? Probably some slum in India some village of poor kids in Africa. Sometimes it almost repulses us when we think of their sewage systems, the illnesses, their filthy water, the crime, the hunger, the suffering, the fact that a tooth abscess can take your life, that drinking water could take your kid's life, the evil is rampant, it rips your heart open. We might even feel bad for them. We may even want to give them something. But do we ever think to exchange places with them? Would we give up our beautiful, expansive, nicely decorated, abundantly supplied homes for that? I recall one scene when we went to Africa 16 years ago in Tanzania. We stayed at the church there and the kids in the village, they would come and play at the church every day. 
and they were so cute, and they'd be wearing pretty interesting clothes. You'd see a Tommy Hilfiger shirt on a kid. Of course, he's the 10th owner of that shirt. You'd see like this cute Sunday dress that's all worn out and torn. I remember one day there was a kid that I'd familiar with because I'd seen him a few days before. He came, and what I saw that day, his clothes were, were really different, more than all the other kids. See, instead of a pair of pants, actually instead of a pair of shorts, the kid came to play wearing a garbage bag. And that was 16 years ago, but that image is so vivid in my mind that he came wearing less than rags to cover his nakedness. To me, that was pretty poor. God looked down from heaven. He saw ungrateful, very selfish, unloving, evil people. He saw murderers, thieves, adulterers, drug dealers, prostitutes, child molesters, alcoholics, oppressive rulers. He says, I'm going to go live there. Not as a mighty king, not as a business owner. I'm going to go as a poor, helpless child. And I will go and I will serve even the least of them. I'll become friends with the lepers and the dreaded tax collectors. I will become hungry. I will feel tired. I too will feel pain. I will be at the mercy of the merciless, the arrogant, the unloving. I'm going to taste rejection by my dearest friends. I'm going to be well acquainted with sorrow. I will drink deeply the cup of loneliness. I too will become naked, wearing less than rags to cover me. I will accept the nails and pools of blood dripping from my brow. I will endure the spitting, the shame, the mockery. I will accept being accused wrongfully and being treated worse than what I deserve. I will become poor. But why? Why did he? It was so that those who were poor, he looked at them and said, I no longer want them to be poor. I want them to be rich. I will leave my home in heaven so that they could share my home with me. I will clothe the naked in righteousness. I will adopt the rejected. I will give hope to the hopeless. I will give help to the helpless. I want them no longer to be poor. What I have, I want them to have. God said what I have, I want them to have. I want them to be rich. I will wastefully lavish on them love. Yes, while they are still sinners, I will demonstrate my love. Mercy without bounds, forgiveness like never seen before. I will give them grace. Grace is that which God gives us that we do not deserve. Someone came up with an an acronym one time that grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Now, I know we don't believe in the ransom, but it does give us an idea that Christ became poor so that we could become rich. To me, that's the best kind of giving. I think it's God-like giving. So, one time, I received a bookmark, and it really helped me understand why God gave I mean, it's this verse to me. For God so loved the world that he gave. So you say, why did God give? It says, because he so loved the world that he gave. 
His only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. But this bookmark kind of broke the verse down for me in a little bit different way that um, it really meant something to me. So I'm going to read the verse a little bit different with this part added in. For God, the greatest lover, so loved to the greatest extent the world, the greatest company, that he gave the greatest action, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest opportunity believes the greatest simplicity in him the greatest attraction shall not perish the greatest assurance but the greatest difference will have the greatest promise everlasting life the greatest blessing you know I think it's interesting. Why did God give? And how did He give? Some of the things that I call God like giving. I hope that we can somehow put these principles into the giving at this church and that we'll never be able to give like God. But there are some characteristics that maybe we could emulate that his giving seems wastefully extravagant. You know, I remember we were shopping for that trip, went to Africa, and uh, we were going shopping in L.A. to buy gifts for the people in Africa. And we went shopping with this lady, and we were like, oh, you know, let's not buy that one. Let's buy more of these, like, cheap ones or whatever. That way we could... And she says, no. When we give to God... We give God the best. We give God the best. She doesn't buy the cheap stuff. She buys the good stuff. God seems wastefully extravagant because he gives us the best stuff. Maybe when we as a church start to give, we won't look for an easy way out. We might look for something that costs a lot. But it's okay because we're giving. We're not just taking. The other thing is that God's giving is not earned by those who receive it. And there's no conditions made when it is given. I don't know, I just had this conversation with someone this week about giving to a homeless person. He says, well, you know, sometimes I give them money and they go right into the liquor store and they buy liquor. So the condition for them to receive the money, they have to look broke, they have to be utterly starving, and they have to spend it the way that we want them to spend it before we're willing to give a whole dollar. Like when we give, we want conditions. God didn't give conditions. He gave not to people who earned it, and he gave to people who could not return it. Isn't that the best kind of giving? The people that just give and they walk away? They don't wait for the thank you. They just give. It just happened to me like two weeks ago at this place called Starbucks. It happens in the drive-thru where you go through, and I felt really bad because I was not getting myself a drink. I was getting my wife a drink, and myself a drink, and my kids a drink, and breakfast. And I got to the window, and the lady said, "Uh, there's nothing to pay. The person before just paid for it. I was like, I mean, I can't even thank them. They won't even know if I care. They won't be able to. And they just did it. Now, of course, I felt like I had to buy like the whole line to equal what I just received. I thought two was good. Um, It should not expect a return. 
And I love the fact that God gives his best. So we know the motivation for God giving. For God so loved the world. What if we made a verse from our perspective? For God so loved the world that he gave. What if we said, for Holy Transfiguration Church loved God so much that they gave? What if that was our prime motivation? It's not about a return on the investment. It's not about whether it will be worth it or not. But because we loved God so much that we gave wastefully, extravagantly, that we gave the best. I wanted to start off with heroes in giving. There's no greater hero in giving than Jesus Christ himself. And when we're looking for a reason or a way to give, He'll be the number one. Next week, we'll talk about some more. Don't forget why God gave you and how he gave to you. Let's stand and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear, loving extremely loving, extremely extravagantly, wastefully giving Father of ours who looked at us that were so undeserving. It's one thing that you could have just given to us from afar. It boggles my mind that you became as we are, that you wanted to share exactly what you have with the people who definitely, as you know more than any, don't deserve it. You know that we'll never be able to return it back. But I pray, dear Lord, that you would cleanse our hearts, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, that you would inspire us to never forget the great God-like giving you gave, that we would in turn learn that one day that we will look at the poor and not see them as, as disgusting, but rather see them as an opportunity to be as you were, to be among them that we might lift others up. I pray, dear Lord, that one day by our poverty we will also make many rich. I know, dear Lord, there's so many things that we hold on to so many earthly, material things, so many American dreams, so many possessions, so many unsatisfied carnal desires in my life and in many of our lives that we're having difficulty getting rid of. I pray, dear Lord, that by your grace and with your strength, you would help us to learn to hold on to the one thing that is truly needful. I thank you, dear Lord, and I say it again, I thank you. The intercession of St. Mary, who gave herself. Through the intercessions and prayers of St. John the Baptist and the prophets and the apostles who gave themselves, for all the martyrs who gave themselves, for all the Christ-loving, God-fearing people who gave of themselves, hear and accept our prayers as your children when we call unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I hope you have a very generously giving week.